So, hello everyone, and welcome to the Gaia Education Glocalizers webinar series. My name is Giovanni Charlo. I am the e-learning coordinator at Gaia Education. Today, I have a very, I'm very excited to bring you this webinar entitled Transitioning from Global to Local Economies in the 21st Century with Helena norbeg hodge Helena is founder and director of Local Futures and the International Alliance for Localization. This Glocalizer webinar is offered by Gaia Education to build capacity in systems thinking and holistic design for sustainability. There are a few uh, housekeeping tips that I would like to uh, uh, mention right now. This webinar, for example, will be recorded and it will later be made available on our YouTube channels. It is also being broadcast live on Gaia Education's Facebook pages. Your microphone and video will be turned off during the webinar, but you are invited to post questions at any time in the question and answer box that's at the bottom of your Zoom application. Helena will answer as many of these as possible at the end of her presentation. I also want to point out some other uh, resources available in Gaia Education's website. Uh, for example, uh, sorry, <clears throat> Um, you can receive a 10% discount for watching this webinar towards our books and other publications on our website. They include the Ecovillages Around the World that was recently published, and also the Four Keys for Sustainability, which were published uh, about 10 years ago, but they are still quite relevant, and they are translated into Spanish, English, and Portuguese. So you can get them in any one of those languages. Additionally, we have the community implementation fast flashcards, which are designed to activate the sustainable development goals that the UN put forth. And we have a multipliers handbook so that you can use these flashcards with your communities to move your community or region towards sustainability. Gaia Education provides online courses on design for sustainability. And at the moment we are uh, running these courses in English Portuguese and Spanish. The next course, uh, right now, the, this week started the Economic Design for Sustainability course. You, there's still time for registering for those courses if you would like. So visit our website and uh, check those out. In addition, there is a local water solution for global challenges. This is a free MOOC. It starts this Friday the 22nd and it runs for five weeks. It's a course that we run online in partnership with UNITAR, Strathclyde University, the Scottish government and crew. The next course, as I said, is the economic design, which is running starting this week and there's still room there. And uh, uh, you can register until the 22nd of March, as you can see on the screen. While you're there, please come also to subscribe to our newsletters and to follow us on social media to join the thousands of people who engage with Gaia Education in conversations about sustainability all over the world. We also have a program called Learning Journey, which is a way for us to certify trainers in the Gaia Education methodology and curriculum. And to become a certified trainer, you all need to do is take a, an online course to uh, deepen your knowledge of that particular subject then take a face-to-face -face education uh, course, uh, Ecovillage Education, uh, Ecovillage Design Education, I'm sorry, uh, course. And the third part is a training of trainers, which will round out your training as a certified Gaia Education trainer. So today we have trans, uh, this webinar entitled Transitioning from the Global to Local Economies and the 21st Century. I'm very excited to introduce Helena norberg hodge Helena, Helena is a pioneer of the new economy, uh, new economy movement, and she's also a recipient of the Alternative Nobel Prize, the Goy Peace Prize, and the Arthur Morgan Award. She is author of the inspirational book called Ancient Futures, and is also the producer of the award-winning documentary, The Economics of Happiness. She is one of the key collaborators, along with Russ Jackson, Daniel Wall, and Jonathan Dawson, who now heads the Schumacher College Economics Department, 
and 19 other experienced educators and activists from around the globe who came together to develop the DNA of Gaia Education's Design for Sustainability curriculum. We are very, very honored to have Helena with us. Uh, these innovative economists and designers within the, uh, the Global Ecovillage Network have come from all over the world in many different ecovillages with years of experience. Helena's contribution to the economic dimension of sustainability is particularly innovative in that it draws from her experience working in the field to improve the economic conditions of traditional cultures. And I'm sure she will tell us more about that. So welcome Helena to this wonderful Glocalizer webinar. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And I should also mention that I'm one of the founders, one of the original founders of the Global Eco Village Network. And so I've been involved with this process now for, uh, well, ever, ever since the beginning. I've been involved with it literally since before it started. So about uh, 35 years, I think it is. And I love it. I think it's one of the most important movements, I hope people will sign up to become trainers. Um, it's, a, it's the sort of, for me, the core of what I call the localization movement, the global localization movement. And at its heart are eco-villages, where people have had the, the courage and the, the wisdom to actually try to live in a way that their hearts, their bodies, long for. We, we all know that we thrive when we can be more deeply connected to other human beings and when we can be more deeply connected to the living world, to the plants, to the animals, to the ways of the moon and the, the living fabric around us. When we feel more connected to that, evidence around the world and mounting evidence shows that that's how we thrive. <clears throat> that is the antidote to most addictions, starting with things like Alcoholics Anonymous, the really, the, the, the sort of therapies that really work are about deep human interconnection and a spiritual approach, an uncovering of ultimately that spiritual truth that everything is interdependent, that everything is interconnected. So um, we, we have this wonderful opportunity to start right now, if we haven't already, to consciously reconnect. Um, and this reconnection, as I said, at the very heart of that movement are eco-villages, but in my organization, Local Futures, we also encourage a path that can be taken wherever you are, whoever you are, and into this broader movement of taking steps towards rebuilding more interconnected ways of living. And those interconnected ways of living have to do with rebuilding genuine interdependence. The genuine interdependence is simply about a way of life where we are connected to other human beings in a way, in a structure, where we can see who we depend on, where we can be at a human scale, dependent on other people and on natural resources, <coughs> excuse me, that are uh, more visible, more in reach, so they're closer. Um, and that is why rebuilding local economies is so important. That's what this is about, is bringing the economy home. Bringing it home from distant anonymous institutions over which we have no control and institutions that very often we don't realize that, but these distant institutions on which we depend are not able to respect our unique individualism. They are not able to respect the unique individualism of every blade of grass, of everything that grows because of the distance. So we have a structural path that has been going on for a long time where economic forces have separated us further and further 
And this separation lies at the heart of massive destruction. In fact, you know, I would argue that separating production and consumption over greater and greater distances is the enemy. It's not about good guys and bad guys. It's not about uh, some, a few men sitting in a dark room plotting to destroy the planet. However, the economic system in which we find ourselves today is a system that has its roots in slavery, in genocide, and um, the genocide included also over several generations burning women at the stake who held deep ecological knowledge and wisdom in both a spiritual way and for healing. Christianity was part of a trajectory that was wedded to an economic system of exploitation by the few at the expense of the many. Now, as this Western Christian-based economic system expanded, it did slaughter people who didn't want to comply, and it enslaved people, forced them onto vast monocultures to produce for a distant market, and of course, by force. Sadly, we have not been clear about the fact that the fundamental structural roots of so separating production and consumption and creating vast global trade, trading corporations, creating banks that had complete freedom to move across the world without the scrutiny of any democratic process this issue of separation of scale is fundamental to the problems we face today. Because even though we have had a sort of cultural liberation from some of the most negative effects of this economic system, you know, we did liberate the slaves, and then later on, countries that were colonized were supposedly freed from colonialism became supposedly independent. But actually, if we study from an economic point of view what happened, they weren't actually liberated because what had been set in motion was this game of giants where giant institutions, giant banks had more and more power. And that meant that more and more of the global population was now enslaved through a process of debt. And we are now at a point where our nation states, our governments are enslaved to that global empire of interlinked corporations and banks. This structural enslavement is extremely important for us to understand. And it's extremely important that we, under, that we also really understand that the only reason absolutely the only reason why that system is still continuing to grow is because of ignorance, our ignorance, the ignorance of the majority of people. And I would argue even the ignorance of the people that are continuing to drive the economic trajectory in a direction of giving even more power to global banks and corporations. Even after the 2008 banking crisis, when the whole world realized how mad it is that some quite well-intentioned, perhaps, young men can sit at their computers and trade in toxic mortgages of people, packages, envelopes, they were called, with the names of people they have never met, they don't even know the names, no idea about the lives they're destroying, the madness of deregulating financial markets in a way that allows for such upheaval. The whole world sort of woke up to this and the obvious solution would have been to regulate the global economy, to regulate not just the banks, but the Monsantos and the Coca-Colas 
and the Arthur Daniel Midlands, uh, giant corporations that have far too much power. But instead, tragically, because we have a corporate global media, and we also have now far too much influence of big money and big banks at universities, we basically are in a situation where big money is funding the big ideas. So I'm also talking about publishing houses. I'm talking about the money that allows people to put $100,000 into just having your book in the window of the bookshop. The promotion, the money that goes into promoting ideas, promoting books, we are now captured by big money shaping our thinking if we don't actively join what I call big picture activism. Big picture activism is a way of finding sources of information and really understanding the big picture. This, remember that information consciousness can spread very quickly. Keep in mind how encouraging it was, how many young people uh, supported Bernie Sanders and how change can sweep across countries. Please don't give up on being a big picture activist and contributing to change at the national and political level. However, I feel so privileged and so happy to have had the deep experience in traditional cultures, particularly a place called Ladakh, and also Bhutan, uh, where I worked over a five year period in the 80s. I feel so privileged to be able to share a message with you, which is very much the message of the Eco Village Network, that you can start right now in your personal life, in a community way, you can take action that will right now improve your well being and the well being of the planet. So there's a, a, a really, uh, an, uh, I think, an amazing opportunity to both transform and change your life and the life of others at a local, more personal level, um, and at the same time, please join the big picture activism as a movement so that we can transform things at the level of the nation state. And that really needs to happen at a um, international level, which is why localization is not about isolation. It is not about retreating into just the local. It's not about thinking locally. We must, we owe it to ourselves in order to be effective and strategic to also understand the global system, let our voices be heard about it, and have that inform our action at the local level. Among other things, we need to be more aware that we're operating in a playing field where the prices in the marketplace are completely artificial. Around the world, you will find that local food is generally more expensive than food that has been transported for thousands of miles. Most people don't know that because of the global configuration of that marketplace that started in slavery and colonialism, we have a complete distortion so that the system encourages trade of identical products. Countries are importing and exporting the same product. Literally, the US exports about a billion tons of beef, turns around and imports about a billion tons of beef. The UK exports 20 tons of bottled water to Australia. Australia exports 20 tons of bottled water to the UK. It is completely unbelievable. And this redundant trade, this insane, insane, crazy trade, stopping that would be the easiest, simplest, most effective, most systemic way of massively reduces reducing climate changing emissions. And yet, somehow people are afraid of talking about it. 
or they are simply not informed of the truth of this global marketplace. And I do want to add to that, that it includes not only shipping identical things back and forth, massively you know, increasing these emissions, but also it's the main reason why we have so much plastic strangling the seas and poisoning and polluting us. The plastic packaging, and it's not just about single use, is the consequence of this global marketplace where simple returnable glass bottles and so on become impossible. But in the localization movement, people are starting to reverse all those trends. And there, I was saying, you know, the eco-village movement is the absolute heart of it, but you also have a much bigger movement, which is the local food movement that is spreading across the world extremely rapidly. I have been a pioneer of that, and I am myself amazed to see how much is happening and how the very people who at one point were um, telling me, no, no, Helen, I know local is not going to work in Australia. And I was told the same in England. I've been told the same in many countries. People don't want that. They want the strawberries in winter and it's not going to work. Well, you know, that was 30 years ago. And I was hearing things like that even 20 years ago in a place like Australia. But in the last decade, I think everybody in the world has woken up to the fact that local food is not only happening, but that more and more people are working to reverse these trends. And I want to add another trend, which means you have to be alert, you have to be informed, because you will find that local apples sold in UK supermarkets will have been flown to South Africa to be washed and flown back again. You will find that macadamia nuts sold, um, you know, harvested in Australia are sent to China to be cracked open and sent back again. Shrimp are flown from uh, UK to Thailand to be peeled. Fish is flown from Norway to China to be deboned. I mean, it is, we are getting more and more statistics about this insane trade. And I hope you will help us with the big picture activism of really alerting people to the fact that if we don't see the big picture, what happens is that the dominant big ideas blame you, blame the individual. There's been a terrible distorted narrative around climate change where the finger has been pointing only at the individual consumer saying nothing about what's happening to production, about how the same policies of globalizing economic activity meant that jobs in the West were being trashed, destroyed, or sometimes overnight, as big business moved to China, to India, to parts of Africa, in order to find the poor countries with the cheap labor to do mass production there. And tragically in the environmental movement, people thought they were on the right side when they said, oh, poor countries don't need to reduce emissions as quickly as we do in the Western world. People had no idea that they were lobbying for big business. They had no idea that in the poor countries, these giant factories needed to have the right to have massive emissions because that's what became the factory for the world. So this combination of destroying livelihoods and driving up emissions, that's the craziness of the dominant globalizing path. And um, what is very exciting is that when you realize how that works systemically, there is such a clear path towards increasing really meaningful livelihoods worldwide in China and in India. Do you think that working for those giant corporations in sweat factories is a good livelihood? No. And 
we need to also know that the house prices around the centers where there is employment are shooting up to levels that are similar to, well, in fact, in many cases, higher than in the West. Already a long time ago, the prices of apartments and houses in Mumbai in India were higher than in the West of London in absolute terms, because for the elite, having a cheap labor market operates very well for them and they earn money that you then multiply by 80 for the local currency. So the system is creating a gap between rich and poor within countries, not just between countries. And it was not in the interest of so-called poor countries to become the factory for the world. It has created not just mass unemployment as people leave their villages, abandon a social fabric of interdependence, of knowledge and self-reliance to become slave-like workers in slave-like factories. The end result has meant also an increase in suicide, depression, all kinds of social problems. Maybe the most important problem I want to mention is that when you marginalize men, particularly in terms of their ability to provide a decent livelihood for themselves and their children, and when at the same time this process of modern economic growth affects their identity, it's destroying unique individual identity, it's destroying cultural identity, it's destroying racial identity. Across the world, this globalizing path is imposing a, a essentially Western consumer identity on people. In the beginning, it used to be blatantly blue-eyed, white-skinned, blonde-haired role models in that promotion of one consumer identity. The glamorous, beautiful people with glamorous, beautiful cars and fashion, clothing, etc., etc. Now, this consumer system has incorporated people of color, but they only belong as long as they are part of that wealthy and um, easygoing, seemingly, you know, not having to work, living in the city. It's always urban consumer role models. Now you can also have a different skin color, but you have to belong to that class of people, otherwise you are nobody. So the threat to identity, as well as the threat to livelihoods, particularly for men, leads to violence. And that violence sometimes extends to their own communities, their own families. It's a very frightening pattern. So let me come back to the healing power of localization. The incredible gift of being able to contribute to and to, with clarity, support the reweaving of interdependence at the local level. This needs to be accompanied by global images, by global information exchange. I actually prefer there to use the term international collaboration and international exchange, um, just so we don't confuse it with economic globalization. Because economic globalization is a path that through trade treaties gives giant global corporations and banks more and more freedom. Our governments are deregulating them while they are over-regulating local, national economic activity. They are, in many cases, bringing in regulations that make it impossible for small farmers, small restaurants, small businesses to survive. Um, and at the same time, they are deregulating the giants. I have to tell you that my experience is in talking to members of parliament, talking to ministers, talking to high-level economists, 
I find that most of them are not aware of this incredible injustice. They don't think about the fact that the overregulation is going on at the local, regional, or national level and what the deregulation means at the global level. They are allowed to remain quite unconscious and ignorant of the damage they do. And this is because most of us, understandably, have not been paying attention to the global game of global giants. Most activists, most individuals have been understandably more focused on the local. So we've had around the world, you know, people trying to protect their rivers, their forests, their jobs, and often in a very single issue way and with a very local perspective. Once we open our eyes and see how much is threatened by this system, there is this huge opportunity for broad-based systemic activism, which above all starts with raising awareness and then will translate into either political change or change at the community level. Whatever we do, it makes more sense to change the I to a we. And to come back to um, look at what rebuilding local economies looks like, I want to say that there is, first of all, um, 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 I would say, first of all, the movement is strongest in America, surprisingly for many people. I think because in America, the awareness of the problems of a corporate top-down economy has been much clearer than in many other countries. The efforts from the bottom up to change direction have been greatest. And we have wonderful examples, uh, for instance, of Detroit, a classical situation where a whole population was abandoned as the car factory went elsewhere. This had been the center of industrial car manufacturing. Suddenly people are dumped and there's uh, many people leave the city and many of those who stay are Afro-Americans and they have been pioneers of starting a local food movement that is now recognized worldwide. I was recently with one of their leaders here in Australia who had come to advise the local city council in Sydney of how to create thriving local food economies. There is a wonderful uh, transfer of knowledge going on. And as I was saying before, at the very, the biggest, the broadest, and the most important is the local food movement. There are many, many different initiatives that belong to that. They, and they are not just in America now, it is around the world. I even have the privilege of knowing the farmer who started the first CSA in Beijing in China. It's like a little diamond in this horrific large city. It's got 18 satellite towns around it. So you're talking about 60 million people crowded together and traffic and pollution, as you know, are just uh, unbearable, terrible. And in the middle there, you have this like little gleaming diamond called Little Donkey Farm. People long for connection to animals, to farming. We evolved closely involved with food production, with the gathering or the growing, the processing, the cooking. It was the heart of every economy. It needs to be the heart of local economies in the 21st century. And it's becoming that through the hard work of people who have usually started without any help from government, no help from media, no help from academia. The beginnings were women who could see their husbands near suicide because farming is trashed by the dominant economy farmers struggling everywhere. And in starting a farmer's market, shortening the distances, they were able to reverse the trend. And as news gets out and people see that it works, the word is spreading. I want to do a little advert for our materials here. 
We have produced a whole local food toolkit, but also our film, The Economics of Happiness, is used around the world, now in about 26 languages, to catalyze localization initiative, particularly around local food, but also eco-villages, also business alliances. One of the best known was started again by a woman in America, Judy Wicks. She had a restaurant and she started becoming aware of the fact that she knew too little about the food that she was buying and, and uh, selling in her restaurant and she started to localize. And she ended up starting an, a business alliance called Ballet, Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. Uh, and these models of setting up local business alliances have also spread. There's been a, a wonderful initiative in England called, um, oh, what's it called? Localize, oh, no, I can't, localize totally, or totally, totally local, totally local. And that has also been an alliance that has been targeting businesses and where the sort of educational tools and the advertising around the benefits of local have been spread and shared. Um, one of the more important aspects of localizing is also finding ways to fund these initiatives. So much of it has been, you know, labors of love and volunteerism, um, but people have now become strategic also about finding ways to finance it. Some of these initiatives are so simple. It's just a question of ideally, you know, if you want to start one where you live, it can be in the big city, it can be in a smaller town. A lot of these changes are happening from the city. You can, for instance, show our film, you can show transition films. There's a film called Demain or Tomorrow. And several of these films all point in the same direction. Sometimes for me, not clearly enough, not clearly enough pointing to the need for shortening distances and creating more human scale interdependence. It's not an absolute, it's a direction. So often if you start a farmer's market, for instance, don't start with the idea, oh, we're only going to have things from 50 miles away. Start with a vision of a systemic transition towards more and more local. Because what starts happening is that as you start these markets, you allow smaller scale production and above all, when it comes to the land, diversified production in food, even in forestry, diversified production, which is what the land needs, must have to thrive. So it's a wonderful understanding that a free market, a market that is closer to the sources of production, stimulates diversification, stimulates a respect for living diversity, stimulates as part of that, a slowing down. We're talking about slower, smaller, more truly beautiful and thriving ways of doing things for both humans and ecosystem. So as this starts happening and people see it, they want to emulate, so more projects start. And so you'll often find, for instance, you know, if you're starting a farmer's market, that in the beginning, you might have to go quite a lot further to source something, to create a, a thriving market, to have one that people really want to come to at least once a week. In the region where I'm living here in Australia, I've helped to start four markets, all within reach, all within about a 20 minute drive. And so four days a week, you can buy local and uh, wonderful food. And um, so what happens then, there are more producers, so then you can start shortening the distances and encourage markets to be set up elsewhere, and further afield. So, um, and the same thing is happening. Um, so what happens then also, I started talking about finance. So with finance, as people start understanding the benefits, 
some communities have only asked, or well, only there have only been maybe 20 people who have put $200 each into a fund to help start, kickstart local initiatives that are needed in the community. Sometimes people have put in more money. Uh, a community in Vermont, I think of 25 people, managed to raise enough money to start a solar farm. Um, and the most exciting um, initiatives in energy are aware of the need to get away from the central grid. But that's, um, that's something that, um, you know, most people are still not aware of the fact that governments have manipulated us into feeding the central grid and the central grid is being manipulated by the big energy companies. And as you probably know, even in renewable energy, it's now the fossil fuel industry that is owning and controlling that development. So again, we need a lot of awareness and we need to support these small initiatives that are demonstrating alternatives. Um, we have, um, as I said, also um, very uh, rapidly growing initiatives in business and in finance. And in finance, um, some people like Jay Tompt in Totnes started a, a very sexy way of raising money based on a television program where people come together and individuals make their pitch. Members from the local community are there offering to support the individual businesses, all in the spirit of community, all in the spirit of helping to enrich your own community, to enrich it socially, in terms of physical health, and also in terms, of course, of lowering emissions, reducing plastic, improving the living environment, the living natural world around you. So there are countless examples now, and we are so thrilled because in our work, every day we receive at least as much good news as we receive bad news about the dominant system. We need all of us to be quite clear about the ability to judge a system for its benefits or its destructive impact. So we're not talking about good guys and bad guys. Really, probably the majority of people who work in big banks and corporations are not that different from people who are working in small shops. As human beings, as individuals, they will care about their families, they will generally want to see a cleaner environment, they will generally share our values. But the blindness to the systems, to the issue of scale, to the issue of the need for diversity, and remember, diversity extends to having the scale of institutions, government as well as business, that can genuinely respect individualism, can respect the authentic ability, the ability to be your authentic self, the ability for a child to grow up feeling that their language is the right language, not feeling mass inferiority because they don't speak the one English language. We can work for a multipolar world where every culture, every race, every individual has the right to deep self-respect. And I can tell you from my experiences, both in the modern world and in ancient cultures like Ladakh and Bhutan, I found that when people had, as part of their traditional way of life, the ability to be engaged with part of interdependent human scale economic activities and institutions, when they felt more in control of their lives, and when they operated at that more human and ecological pace and scale, it's about slowing down as well they felt perfectly fine the way they were. And that is the precondition for tolerance of others. That is what we need to respect the other. We can go on talking and talking about how now in the world we have to 
moved from a tribal identity to a national identity we moved to. Now we have to have empathy for the whole world. That discourse is part of a dominant narrative that doesn't understand the difference between these two systemic paths, a path that leads to deeper self-respect, more control over your lives, and therefore much greater tolerance for the other, for difference. It's the path to peace. It's the path to genuine sustainability. And I really hope uh, that some of you will use our materials, including my book, Ancient Futures. I didn't have time today to talk about the amazing lesson I had from living in and working in Ladakh or Little Tibet. It's the westernmost part of Tibet. The Dalai Lama is the spiritual head. And I learned to speak the language fluently and lived with the people for years before the advent of the modern economy, before the advent of development. And I had this lesson in systems thinking. I saw that the joy, the health, the vibrancy of the people was connected to a whole way of life. And I saw that with development came a form of schooling that trained young people in monocultures, never happened throughout history. Just putting 35 year olds in a room together is a way to create elbows and competition it only happened because of industrial production that suited a few wealthy to the detriment of the majority. We have to rethink industrialism in all aspects, especially in education and schooling. It's being done around the world as part of the localization movement. It's happening, but it's on a relatively small scale and we need a lot more energy behind it. And the localization movement, the eco-village movement, are part of that training. I will stop now and take questions. I have a lot more to say, many different areas. I hope it hasn't been too chaotic, what I've been saying. As you can see, I'm doing it freely and um, uh, maybe at some point a more structured linear talk would bring more, um, but I hope uh, that you got something out of it. Thank you so much, Helena. Uh, of course, uh, a structure and linear uh, talk is what we are all used to. So sometimes it's refreshing to hear somebody who comes from an inspiration, something that is really moving them from inside as you are. And um, uh, the work that you have done is so inspirational, I guess, is the word that I uh, can think of. But, uh, you know, just, just an approach to localization that can be applied to small and big settlements everywhere is so much what we need. And this idea of the diversified production of our food uh, so that we can work more towards food security. Uh, what a concept. Why aren't we doing that everywhere? So um, I got many uh, great tips from what you were talking. Particularly, I was paying attention to this idea of changing the I to us and to work with legislation, uh, to, uh, to uh, work with the tolerance for others and those kind of more um, spiritual, I would say, or uh, somehow worldview type of approaches to economy. I would like to invite the uh, participants, the attendees in today's uh, webinar to pose some questions if they would like. Um, I would like it if you can use the question and answer box, but if you can't find that, uh, perhaps you can use the chat box in the, uh, in the app. I see somebody has uh, their hand up, uh, Raul, but uh, we're not turning on microphones for this session, Raul. If you don't mind, maybe you can post your question in the question and answer box or in the chat box. I do have a question, by the way, Helen, okay. <laughs> because I did hear you mention uh, the need for funding in order to activate some of these localization projects. And I was just wondering, uh, why does this need funding? Why can't people start trading locally and uh, build up a localization scheme that way? 
Well, because most people in the West are so trapped in, in incredible time poverty. And so to liberate themselves, to be able to really give the time to do things, helping with funding. And I'm asking particularly middle class people or people who are better off to support these initiatives. Because of course, people you know, who are struggling to just pay the mortgage and survive can't, don't even have the free time to think about these differences. And the tragedy that I also didn't, you know, I'd like to, <laughs> oh, there's so many themes to talk about, but one of them that's so tragic is the self-blame. So people are caught up in a politics of identity and, the, and it includes self-blame, feeling guilty, feeling inadequate, particularly among young people. There's an epidemic of anxiety and depression. And so much of it is, we believe it's to do with the, the state of the world, you know, the message that climate change may destroy all of us. I see it as being more complex than that. And one of the key things that plays in is the enormous pressure to just succeed and survive and deal with all the information at school and then look for some kind of meaningful job. And they basically don't exist. So this, uh, we're, we're losing people to epidemics of depression and anxiety. So I would urge anyone who can afford it to help support the projects that can provide the training and start a path to different livelihoods and different economic activity. And of course, alternative education. You know, some of the schools that are much more sane and healthy cost money because they're not subsidized by our governments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, do you know, um, can you talk about some examples where localization is thriving? I know you mentioned the United States and, and also in, in uh, Europe, there are some places where people have taken to localization. Can you um, maybe tell a little more about that? Well, I guess the, the ones that I, you know, the ones that I'm most excited about are the food ones because they are changing the modes of production. They're healing the soil and bringing back the earthworms and the diversity at the same time that they're growing healthier food and people have, you know, livelihoods. There's a young farmers movement. Uh, that is so exciting where young people really want to be engaged in this. So of course permaculture is part of that and it's being married to um, biodynamic and organic farming. So it's not just household scale. Mm. So for instance, around us where we, where we live in, in, in Devon, near Schumacher College, in Devon, you know, just on our doorstep, there's now a new farm that is uh, marrying permaculture and biodynamics. As part of that, they also do training in permaculture and growing. They have also been able to get some funding from local councils. So they have a troubled youth who come and are able to do some work on the farm and are healed from psychological problems in doing that work. And then just a five minute walk away from there, we have a fabulous project with prisoners who are allowed uh, in a few months before they're due to leave to come onto this project, just a small piece of land, but where prisoners are learning how to grow food, how to cook, how to sit down and eat together. Many of them have said they've never done that before. And even worse, they've said they've never ever had conversations before where someone was really interested in hearing about what they were feeling, what they were thinking. You know, our conversations in the modern competitive world are often about showing off. Mm -hmm. They're not about vulnerable, heartfelt exchange and being human, humble and human. So anyway, this prison project, you know, of course the success rate, the recidivism, you know, return to prison rate is a fraction of the normal. But this is not happening because government is funding and supporting it is happening from grassroots bottom-up initiatives that need more funding that need more airtime so that they can be emulated in other parts of the world ah. well we have thank you for your answer helena um we have a couple of questions in the chat uh one is 
let's see, um, is the role of cooperatives in transitioning from global investor owned businesses to local diverse participatory and sustainable member owned enterprises? Is this the role of cooperatives? <laughs> well, I would just say that cooperatives <laughs> should have that as their role, but I would be, I feel sometimes there is a bit of an overemphasis on cooperative because of course cooperative has a very nice ring to it and private enterprise doesn't. But you know, paradoxically, uh, particularly in terms of the corporate world, the publicly traded corporations are the structural problem where you get this public you know, ownership of blind investors who just want profit and you have the CEO caught up in this rat race of only being able to focus on the bottom line. And uh, so cooperatives have in many cases been large numbers of producers who came together to compete in the global system. So they came together to become bigger, to be able to compete with big and global. That doesn't necessarily bring out the best modes of production. So I'm often talking about the co-op of the future being the cooperation between producers and consumers that happen in these more localized or human scale structures. They don't always have to be within the same area. They can sometimes extend across the world, but in a human scale uh, chain of knowledge and eyes, eyes per acre, eyes for you know, really knowing what's going on. So I would say co-ops are often a good idea, but really pay attention to the scale and try to establish those shorter links. Uh, so again, you, know, you have buyer co-ops where people get together again to get a better deal out of the big market. Uh, but let's be careful about not just trying to get, you know, many small to compete with the big. Let's try to remember that human scale is of vital importance. And it's of vital importance because we must have the feedback from our actions that we get when, when we can see the impact on other people or on nature of what we do. This is why localism is really ultimately of absolute necessity if we're going to become more humble, more intelligent, more sophisticated, because in the long distance systems, we become blind and stupid and reductionist knowledge is fueling larger and larger scale enterprise and speed. So we have to really be careful now of this huge step towards more AI, more dumb systems that cannot respond to diversity. And, um, and really, in our efforts, pay attention to human scale. Don't, I've, had the, I've had the experience of helping many small enterprises to get started, particularly around local food. And people love them and they became successful and they became bigger and bigger. And then people still think, oh, well, great thing, local, great brand. But no, we have to become more alert as consumers, as citizens of what we want to support. I agree with you so much. I, I'm a big fan of cooperatives and particularly food co-ops. Yeah. And, I've been to, and I also helped start several, but there does seem to be a tendency. Everybody thinks that growth is the way to go. And uh, eventually growth simply catches up with us. It, it slips yeah. out of our fingers. Yeah. And that's what happened yeah. to some of the co-ops I've been involved with as well. Yeah. Um, there is a, a question from Morag. She would like to know what the name of the farm near Toten is that you mentioned is. Oh, the, it's, the farm near Totnes, it's, um, I, I know it so well, uh, but I have to write another name, slips my mind, but it's just on, just in week, it's in week, W-E-E-K, and um, they have two names for it. Yeah, Apricot Farm. I'm not quite sure, I think they have planted a few apricots, I'm not quite sure why it's called Apricot. Farm. <laughs> Great. Apr apricot farms. Great. Apricot farms. That's yeah. easy to remember, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so uh, Pedro has one more question. Um, he says, Helena, like you told us in the film Ademun, explain oh, yeah. the yes. solution. 
and also yeah. refer that local and small producers and producing more than the big are producing more than the big companies. Why is this not well known? Can you help us understand why the relevance of big producers is more than in reality? The relevance. Uh, uh, I, 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 think, uh, I think he means that oh, why are the small producer as, as, um, as well featured because they seem to yeah. be producing yeah. more than big companies. I, I think that's yeah, right. Well, that, that's right. I mean, this is, I should have mentioned, that's an important thing that you mentioned, that actually small diversified farms will always be able to produce much more than monoculture. You know, you take any bit of land, you know, just in your garden. If you just produce one thing on it, you won't be able to get as high a yield as if you produce, uh, if you have a number of things growing, some of them may ripen at other times, different times, you will be able to get more from the land, particularly if you add animals, animals that eat waste, you know, it could be rabbits, it can be chickens, it can be goats, it can be cows, that, you know, in all traditional farming sort of peasant societies, the animals never competed with humans, they didn't eat grain, they ate waste. And they then produced labor, you know, leather work uh, and, and high quality protein. So this diver these diversified systems, you'll be able to get much more from. The reason we don't hear about that is because both consciously and unconsciously, the dominant narrative is being led by big money and big ideas where people are viewing the world from the top down and people are falling into just this very simplistic idea that of course a big farm is going to produce more than a small farm. Well, yes, of course, one big versus one small, but many small of the same size as the big are going to produce vastly more and provide more meaningful livelihood. That's probably one of the most important statistics we need to get out there. Um, there are well-intentioned scientists who are, you know, convinced that we must have GMOs. We must now have uh, satellites and all and ever more energy-intensive, resource-intensive path to feed the world. They have been trained into believing that. And many of them have only, I mean, I've known a few scientists like that who were geneticists and who had been led to believe that. And it was only one of them, now don't ask me her name because it's been years since I met her. Um, but anyway, she was at the University of Indiana. And she was saying that she had only by accident on a holiday in India started hearing a counter argument and was suddenly shocked to find out that here were all these small farmers, very clear about the destruction of genetically modified food and so on. And so she, she became a local food advocate, um, but it was by chance you know, that she got that information. Yeah, I think that the key there is that diversification of production, <clears throat> which keeps a, a much healthier uh, farm and production system. Yeah. Well, um, this has been very illuminating and I don't see any other questions at the moment. We also have... Yeah. Run, yeah, I, I see this thing about the Venus project, and I, I oh, yeah. would warn, I would warn people to re resist the five G. I think it's we we are getting more and more evidence of the very serious effects of electromagnetic radiation, and in Scandinavia, where we've had a little more science in the public interest, there have been many more warnings about mobile phones and children and so on. So. The other thing we need to look at is the addictive nature of the screen on young children and do what we can uh, to use these technologies that are so pervasive with a different message. You know, as we're doing today, let's try to get a message out on these screens that ultimately will mean less time on the screen. Yes. So many people who have spent, you know, being forced into a livelihood where they're spending the entire day five days a week or sometimes more on the screen, develop a deep hunger for real connection to nature and to people, to real face-to-face -face contact. It's not in our interest 
to encourage an economic path where more and more of us will be locked into this. Technology has made it so difficult for us to connect with each other. I can't believe yeah. it. Yeah. 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 I saw that. I, I haven't heard of the Venus project, but um, it sounds interesting. Uh, a future community where abundance resources are equally distributed in a circular city. That certainly sounds interesting. I will look that up, but I haven't heard of it either. So thank you again, Elena. Well, thank you. And thank you for all your years with the Eco Village Network. How many years have you been with it now? Well, you know, I, uh, I, I was a co-founder of an Echo Village in Mexico 40 years ago. 40 and, years uh, ago. Yes, yeah. and the Echo Village Network, uh, I joined uh, right away when it started going about, uh, wow, it's been 22 years now. Yeah, yeah. Years. So yeah. actually, uh, a long time. I feel like my whole life has been dedicated to this. Yeah. Well, lovely to see you. And you're, you're in New York State now, aren't you? I am in Connecticut, yeah. but close to New York. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, thank you and all thank the best. Thank you. It was so nice thank to you. see you again. Uh, I'm going to uh, share a couple of more uh, slides to close our session today. Um, first of all, again, with a big thank you to Helena for this uh, wonderful, inspiring uh, presentation and also quite enlightening, actually. And I want to point out that our economic design course is running online right now. You still have time to register for it if you're interested in learning more about economic design. And uh, Gaia Education is offering a special discount for people on this webinar on our publications. The Echo Villages Around the World is a wonderful book that just came out this past summer. And then the uh, Four Keys for Sustainable Design are published now in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. And you can get a discount by entering that code on top of the screen uh, in our web pages. Go to our shop and you will find it there. You will also see there the community implementation flashcards, which are uh, a set of flashcards to activate talk in our communities about the sustainable development goals. And those are accompanied by the handbook for multipliers, which is a way to uh, multiply the work that we're doing in sustainable design. Um, oops, let's see what I have. Oh yeah, <clears throat> don't want to uh, go without mentioning the learning journey that Gaia Education provides to become certified Gaia Education trainers. There are three steps. You can find out more on our website as well. There are training of trainer courses going on around the world. Eco Village Design Education courses going on around the world and our online e-learning programs, which I already talked about, which are offered in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. While you're there, come and subscribe to our newsletter to find out more about what's going on with Gaia Education. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Join the thousands of people who are there now um, sharing information, forming community online, and continuing this work of learning how we can change our presence on the earth. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Helena. Thank you.